Welcome to part three of my series looking at Carl Bau's creation in the 21st century. This episode is called Noah's Flood, Fact or Fantasy, and features John Hefner. Um, as you recall, the part two, I ended with Ba's incredibly ridiculous explanation of how the asteroid belt was formed from a planet destroyed by an energy animation from Earth. Uh, yeah, it, it, amazing to me. Again, I challenge anybody to find me a dumber creationist claim. I, I honestly believe, I seriously believe, that Mystical Forest, upon hearing that claim, would say, that's fucking stupid. Okay, that's how bad that claim was, truly. Okay, uh, he's going to go on and talk about comets now. Historical fact. Well, and uh, this slide right here does also, because the scripture says the fountains of the great deep broke open, and we have the scar on our planet of this uh, cracking of six-mile granite crust. Well, Called the Mid-Oceanic Ridge. Exactly. 46,000 miles long. That's right. And ocean water going in there and hitting that hot magma rot would have flashed to steam jets, supersonic steam jets, Maybe the comets that we see today, which are essentially dirty snowballs, came from some of that could have been ejected. escape velocity that exceeded our escape velocity. All the need is 17,000 miles. Then, yes. What goes up must come down. That would be an interesting hypothesis, except for the fact that we've actually studied cometary material. And it can be demonstrated that in terms of where in the solar system, does it, where, where does the isotope match the closest? And it seems to be... It matches the wa the ratio of heavy hydrogen to n to standard hydrogen um, that we see in the outer planets Neptune and Uranus. Okay, not it does not match the isotope ratio we see on Earth. So therefore, indicating that comets had an origin out in the outer fringes of the solar system, not in the inside of the solar system. At least the water ice did. Now take us beyond that, please. Well, one of the objections frequently voiced in a cross-sectional crowd is, well, how could he have taken those huge dinosaurs on board the ark? And most of them don't know how big the ark was. But I suspect, you know, we need to be aware that even the largest varieties of dinosaurs... Well, I'll be damned, I had no idea that a mammoth was a dinosaur. You know, we need to be aware that even the largest varieties of dinosaurs come from an egg about the size of a football. In fact, we have two Tyrannosaurus batar eggs at the Creation Evidence Museum, just a little larger than a football and not quite as big around. Well, I remember transporting an egg nest for you from the museum to Dr. Fox at Baylor. That's two correct. years ago, and the whole nest of five or seven eggs, I think, was yes. about, you know, this size, yes. size of a trash can lid or something. But the point being, probably he took the juvenile, young. That's right. As long as we had one with a pink ribbon, one with a blue ribbon, uh, everything correct. would work. And God would see to it, and even <laughs> Noah would be concerned about that. Well, they'd, they'd take up less room, they'd eat less, they'd live longer. It makes perfect sense of yes. God's efficiency. Okay, the Jonathan Safardi, they, he took baby dinosaurs hypothesis. Uh, I love that. That's, that it's, it's, it's pretty, pretty funny because there's a whole bunch of problems associated with that as well. Okay, so according to the story, you know, Noah was building his gigantic boat and then God caused all of the animals, all the kinds at least, of the earth to walk towards the Middle East, um, you know, trotting along, which presumably would take a significant amount of time. But luckily the ark took a long time to build, so the animals had plenty of time to get there. Um, so, but the funny thing about it, so for things that say things like rodents that maybe have a you know a year or two lifespan, you know, traveling from Tierra to Fuego, having to walk all the way to the Middle East, um, you know, you kind of kind of imagine that that even if at the time they all they also say that maybe the continents were all fused together at that time, um, but even so, you know, the time it would take them to walk, you'd think well. You'd, they would die on the way. Hopefully, their babies would then take up the take up the the hike. You know, so it would be a multi -gen it would be a generational trip for a lot of these animals, and so on. But the problem with the dinosaurs, and this has been pointed out by others, is that okay? So presumably, this wasn't like an egg hatched. You know, a sauropod egg hatched in Antarctica, and that little baby started trotting towards the ark so it could get on the ark while it was still little. Presumably, what God did was bring adult sauropods that did their thing, popped out a bunch of eggs. Noah grabbed a couple of them or a couple of the babies after they hatched and ran onto the ark with them, you know, right before the door shut. 
that's sort of the storyline that that Sephardi is trying to to get across. And then Sephardi, of course, now this isn't Hefner, but I'm just, I'm, I'm assuming this is the it's the same source that uh, that Walt Brown got his information from. It's the same same argument um, in his feasibility study. But the problem with that, uh, the 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 issue is 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 that uh, Sephardi assumes, or Walt Brown assumed, that dinosaurs grow really, really slowly. Like, look at reptiles. Look how long you know reptiles grow slow. So, therefore, dinosaurs grew slow. The reality is, we know a lot about dinosaur growth from looking at bones, um, slices of bones. Um, we can tell a lot about them now. We've learned a bunch, um, and it turns out that dinosaurs grew following a bird curve, much closer than a mammal curve, or way f- faster than a reptile curve. Um, so what this means in practical terms is is that, like birds, dinosaur eggs grew up to not adult size, but they grew up very, very rapidly. In the span of months, they grew to enough large enough size for them to sort of be on their own for, for solitary species or joining the herd or whatever for the non-solitary species. Um, things like Apatosaurus, uh, the estimates are uh, 5 to 10, as they grew, changed, Five to ten kilograms per day. So, Mr. Noah has his little baby, cute little baby pair of apatosauruses. Aren't they adorable, right? Um, he's got them on the ark, and he's you know feeding them his his alfalfa or whatever the hell he brought on to feed them. Um, and well, what do you know? A couple days later, at five kilograms a day, well, they're a little bit big. So let's go to let's skip ahead to day three hundred, right? 300 days later, now this is the slowest growth rate. We're talking, I'm not even going to get into the, the, one the, let's look at just the five kilograms per day. Oh, they're only one and a half fucking metric tons now, right? One and a half metric tons of a Patasaurus. And Noah's still got, well, like, what, 130 something days left, right? Um, he's still got a long time with, a, with, Three metric tons of sauropod stumbling around on the ark, needing to be fed. That's just one species, one kind. Um, you, you see quickly where this baby dinosaur thing breaks down really, really fast. Um, some people have even suggested it to all the animals that all of the animals he brought were babies. But well, you know, mammals require milk. I mean, there's all. It just it, it increases the problem. It doesn't fix the problem of this feasibility study. And again, since we're giving academic justification and uh, academic viability to all this, the only force, the, the greatest natural force we find in common usage on the Earth is water. Hey, you heard it here first. Water is one of the fundamental forces of nature, um, along with the, the uh, weak interactive force, the strong interactive force, the electromagnetic force, the gravitational force, and finally, the water force. There is one other force greater, and that's nuclear activity. That's right. The only force in the entire universe more powerful than water is thermonuclear. And when the Bible states the earth melted, we see the results of that even today in the Moho Rovisi down below the, the mantle and, uh, and granite of the earth. We find the total molten area due to thermonuclear reaction. Mm-hmm. So here we have it all in a viable context. Well, uh- okay, this, Yeah, that's right. So guys, we know this now, right? Um, the core of the earth, that hot molten core, it's fueled by thermonuclear energy. That's what's making that... Well, who knew, right? You know, fuck the sun. We don't need the sun, for Christ's sake. We got, we, our earth is generating its own energy. We don't need that. Right, so the hot, the hot, the the molten portions of of the earth, under the crust of the Earth have nothing to do with the relationship between you know density and and pressure and heat and frictional forces and gravity. It's nuclear powered. Well, and I think it's significant that it's his voice that spoke it into yes. existence. It's his voice that took it out. Yes. And we see a schematic of planet Earth with uh, perhaps a canopy of some sort around it. Certainly. And, uh, God uttered his voice, the earth melted, the scripture you mentioned. Three water sources, the fountains of the great deep broke open, the windows of heaven were open. Well, these supersonic steam jets would have cut trench windows in any such canopy, yes. causing catastrophic uh, amount of water to pour down, and cold collapse. nuclei around which moisture droplets would condense. It couldn't rain 40 days and 40 nights anywhere now. 
any place on the earth, but with all this moisture going up and then falling back down in torrential rain, rain is the third source of water yes. mentioned. And well, could never rain 40 days and 40 nights anywhere on earth today, except where it actually does does um 1953 in ketchikan alaska it rained 101 days continuously uh and the record for world record uh as far as i know it still stands from 1993 1994 on the island of oahu in hawaii uh it rained 247 days straight then you mentioned the sedimentary rock we see extremely parallel layers that speaks of rapid deposition well, except where they're not. They're very uniform in their thickness. I took this picture in Wyoming. Except, of course, where they vary in thickness. We find uh, the absence of topsoil between the layers. Except where we find paleosoils in between the layers. We find absence of past vegetation between the layers. Except where we find evidence of vegetation growing in between the layers. These were not events that were separated by millions of years. They're There's totally not, conformable. There's not vertical erosional cuts like erosion would naturally do. Except where there are erosional cuts. So properly understood, flood geology answers a lot of questions. Absolutely. And except for all of the thousands and thousands of observations that flood geology can't explain. I believe the audience today has been privileged to carry on an academic exercise in your minds. And here's where I have to agree with Mr. Baugh. Uh, young Earth creationists out there, flood geologists, whatever you want to call yourselves, uh, the evidence for this is only in your mind. There, there is no real world evidence. Uh, he didn't show it here and he can't show it, it doesn't exist. It's that simple. In your thought process, led by Professor John Hefner, we have seen that the plausibility of the flood and the evidence for the flood are unmistakable. So again, I'm going to say he did nothing of the sort in this entire video, okay? This is the thing about it. This is what this always, I mean, it's, it's blowing smoke. Okay, he claims that he showed the feasibility of the flood and he showed this and he showed that. What did he actually show? What did we see? A model of a boat? Uh, completely and totally bullshit interpreted genetic data? Uh, what, what, what else? What do we have? Uh, fossils? That, well, that, well, we, that, a lot of the ones like he showed, like the fossil fish, um, show evidence that they died in slow depositional anoxic sediments. We can tell by the sediment type. We can tell by the, the locality, things like that. We know exactly how those fossils died. We know exactly what happened. They weren't buried in a flood. So he showed absolutely nothing. He shows, this is what they do. They show a bunch of things that are true. You know, they'll hold up a, look, here's an ammonite. This ammonite was killed in a great flood bullshit. No, you're saying, yes, it's a real ammonite, but your conclusions about its death, its taphonomic taf stat, whatever, is a load of crap. And that's what they, this entire video has been just another exercise in. So, anyway, um, I'm going to get down to his conclusion. Would you pray this simple prayer with me? Okay, what the hell? You know what? Experimentation time. I'm going to give it a try just to see, just to prove that nothing's going to happen, alright? Just bow your head, pray this prayer with me from your heart. Dear God, I too am a sinner. Dear God, I too am a sinner. I've seen the destruction on planet Earth and the destruction in my own heart. Okay, lots of messed up stuff. Lord Jesus, thank you for coming to planet Earth, for giving us hope. I need you as my Savior right now. I open my heart to you. Lord Jesus, come in right now. Save me forever, and I will live for you with all my heart. Okay, and all, all of that stuff that he just said, uh, whatever, whatever, whatever. I, f I think I feel something. something something's happening. Ouch. It, it feels like something is trying to get into my, my chest. Ouch. Oh, jeez. Ouch. That, oh, my God. Oh, God. Kneel before your Lord Jesus Christ.